Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Wilder Ride, our listener's lounge. A chance for us to do something a little different in our season three. Rather than look at a movie one minute at a time, we're analyzing a guest one moment of their life at a time. I'm your host, as you heard from the open, Alan Sanders, joined as always with my bud, Walt Murray. Walt, what's going on, man? Hey, not too much. How you doing? You know, it's been one of those really productive, but at the same time, crazy weeks. We just got done with the holiday, uh, spent... Probably two and a half straight days doing nothing but manual labor, trying to continue to work on these home improvement projects. And I got to the point where I realized I had an email that someone had sent me a text message saying, hey, uh, did you get to that that recording I asked for a couple of days ago? I was like, whoops. <laughs> I was like, yeah, hold on. Between Thanksgiving and all the projects, I totally didn't check email. So I'll get on it right away. And he's like, okay, I just want to make sure you got it. There's no, no super big rush, but... You went like three days with no response, and that's not normally like you. It's like, yeah, felt bad. <laughs> well, I feel like I probably needed to have steel reinforced my chair today because I think all I've done, uh, this is Monday that we're recording, all I've done since Thursday is eat ham and turkey. So <laughs> I uh, have, um, have way, way overdone it for Thanksgiving. Well, let me ask you this, because, I mean, it was a big controversy going into the holiday. And I got to tell you, I I was going just a little nuts with the headlines today. I don't want to get, you know, heavy, but it went from be really careful. You know, if you're going to do something, you know, we don't recommend it, but just be careful and make sure you know who's around and, you know, use caution. You know, we live in a state that's a little bit more open. And then I get in this morning and everything I'm hearing is, well, if you went somewhere, chances are you got it. I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) Stop yeah, it. It, it it's crazy Monday morning quarterbacking on, on that. Um, yeah, we didn't this year. We kind of elected because my dad is older. He's had a triple bypass, um, and his wife had a pneumonia right before all this craziness started. Uh, we elected not to go see them and to kind of give them a a, a week off, and then. My in-laws are older, so we decided to kind of give them a break as well. And so we just stayed home, which was, you know, which was good. We'd rather seen everybody, but it was kind of nice to have a lower key uh, Thanksgiving and get some stuff done around the house. And uh, so that was, you know, it was kind of okay. It wasn't great. wasn't optimum, but uh, we had a good time. And so uh, it was kind of nice to spend some time with the kids. I I know they're getting older and we're not going to have all that much time as time goes by. So uh, we we definitely took advantage of that. Well, we chose in a similar fashion, but not purposely. Usually it's my brothers and and, and all of the you know the wives and kids all will get together at my mom's house. Ever since my dad passed away, it's been sort of like my mom's thing. I want to do all the holidays like you were doing them all. What's the difference? But we kind of feel more obligated now. And, uh, you know, we, we did go over there, but my brother... His boss came down with uh, a positive test, no symptoms, but oh. he had a positive test. So my brother was like, I really shouldn't, you know, come over. I'm like, how long has it been since the positive test? Well, it's been five days for him, but I'm just trying to stay low key. I'm like, that's fine. My other brother had other family visiting. And then my final brother uh, was just indisposed. So it ended up being unintentionally very low key as well. Yeah, I think that's kind of the the right way to go right now, even though I've been a little bit more on the... Eh, it's overblown. I'm not wearing a mask uh, kind of stuff. Uh, I think just being a little wise, giving people some distance and and not exposing those people who are, you know, in those high risk categories. That's probably a smart thing. So, yeah, I, I opted for a change to be smart. And you got to know your family. Like my mom, she still like she walks. She goes out with her friends. She's still I mean, all of her senior citizen friends, they go out together. She's in the church. She She does all this stuff. So she's super, super active, super healthy. And she's, and she's of that mindset. You're not going to tell her what to do, you know? 
Oh yeah. Well, my dad is absolutely that way. Um, <laughs> he, he's like, Hey, I lived through Vietnam and 25 years of FBI. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. So <laughs> we, we kind of made some decisions for him this year and, uh, and backed him off. But of course he and I are going to lunch tomorrow. He's not slowing down much. Well, so. you've had, you've, you've met up with him a couple of times, haven't you? Yeah, we get together pretty regularly and, uh, we, um, probably going to go to the gun range this Saturday and, uh, I, I think it was just mostly not getting in a big group. And if we had all gone over there, it would have been uh, my two stepsisters and their kids and husbands and my brother and his family uh, and my family. We'd have had about 25 people. So that just kind of got to be a little bit bigger than we were comfortable with. Gotcha. Okay. Well, beyond, because uh, we got a guest coming up in just a minute. It's a guy, a guy you actually stumbled across, but... Um, before we kind of set the tone, because I do want to, I do want to tell a quick story before we bring him on. Uh, anything else going on with you? Because I know I talked about a lot of the home improvement projects. You just said you've just been pounding leftovers. Uh, yeah, I've, you know, we're kind of starting the downhill run towards the end of the year at work, and I'm just buried. I got a ton of stuff I've got to get out, and then I'm still working on some home improvement projects and things like that. So I hope that in December I can really make some. Uh, Make some improvements around the house and get some work out of the way. So start January fresh, but uh, we'll see how all that goes. Well, I want to uh, I want to set the table for our guest this way because something happened a few years back, and it was the first time that a celebrity death actually made me go, "Huh," you know, because normally I kind of I don't want to say mock, but it, it, I sort of have an issue with people who go all in on. Oh my God, so and so died. My life will never be the same. Like, okay, you didn't know the person directly. You weren't best friends with them. It wasn't like you knew the person, but they're, you know, those people that just go to social media and they just, they go, they, they fall to pieces as if their world has come to an end. Yeah. And a lot of times they're people I've never even heard of. And um, yes, but I, I'm, I'm with you on this one because you and I talked the day this happened and both of us were kind of in the same place with yeah, this. Yeah. We, we, we had met up for a, a recording. And it was the day that Tom Petty was announced had passed away. And we were like, oh, my God, like that was one of the guys that was part of the soundtrack of both of our, you know, teenage years growing up high school and and beyond college. And it was one of my wife's favorite artists. And, you know, we would listen to the Tom Petty channel on Sirius XM. And that was the first time I said, OK, I kind of felt this one. I mean, I, I didn't walk around in a stupor and, and not go to work or something. I was still able to function. But. It was one of the first celebrity deaths that I went, wow, that I wasn't. First of all, I didn't see it coming. And second, we're not going to get any more Tom Petty music. I know. And I have been a huge Tom Petty fan since Damn the Torpedoes came out. I remember buying that um, the month it came out. And I've been just a huge fan ever since. I've got the six disc um, playback uh, that goes through all of his old collections. I mean, it's just great music. I've just been a huge fan. And, and remember when he, they first announced that he was going to the hospital, that there was, a, you know, that he was found in a coma. Then he was dead. Then he was not dead. Then he was dead. And it was just kind of a traumatic uh, few days that we were dealing with that. And then when he, they finally did say, yes, he's gone. Uh, it it just really, really hit me. And I think what you just said, being that it was a, a bit of the soundtrack of my life through high school and ever since, and every album that comes out, I, I pick up, and it, it's it, it was quite a shock. Because that hit us both, and because we're talking about it now, I think it's a perfect segue to our guest. And I'll let you actually do the introduction, because you stumbled across the book. Uh, yeah, I actually stumbled across uh, Christopher McKittrick on um, on Twitter, and for all the bad things I have to say about Twitter, for once, Twitter comes through. <laughs> and uh, Christopher and I had hooked up. I, I saw his book on there. I started looking into his uh, background, and I said, "Man, this is a guy that we've got to have on." So I reached out to him, and he got right back to me and said, "Yeah, that'd be great." Uh, he's listened to a few of our episodes and. Uh, agreed to come on. So I'm really excited to be able to have him on with us. And I'm impressed with a couple of things that he has going. Uh, 
I'm about halfway through the Tom Petty book. There's also a book that he's written on the Rolling Stones in New York. So he takes Tom Petty in Los Angeles and his life and career there, the Rolling Stones in New York and their life and career there. And it's kind of a fascinating look at that point in history. And his research is really great. The way that he incorporates the, you know, what's going on in the country, what's going on in Los Angeles at the time, the influences and how the the, the bands influence uh, the culture. I am super impressed. So I'm really excited to have Chris on with us tonight. All right. Well, let's do it, audience. Put your hands together and let's welcome to our stage into the listeners' lounge, Christopher McKittrick. <laughs> Christopher, welcome to the Listener's Lounge. How are you? Thank you so much. I was considering just staying quiet so Walt could say more great things about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ran out, so <laughs> so now we have to bring you in. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. No, we we enjoy meeting people of all kinds of backgrounds and persuasions. And But the one thread, and Walt and I talked about this as, as we started to wind down our guest list for this year and started looking already into next year, the one common thread, and we realize it's kind of like our unwritten rule for how we invite people to our stage, it's got to be somebody who's doing something they're passionate about. I don't care what it is. If, if it's if it's you know painting buildings or if it's selling bricks, if they are the most passionate person I've ever talked to or met because they love what they're doing, then they've got a compelling story to tell. And I think you fit that category. You have got a passion for entertainment and entertainment writing. And what, you know, I haven't read the book yet, but what Walt's been saying has me, you know, really compelled to get the book simply because he said you write it in such a way that it just really strikes a chord. And so I guess the first thing we're going to start off with is how did you know and at what point that you were a writer? So that's a very, very fascinating question because I, from as long as I can remember, I was always making up stories with my action figures and, you know, and I remember even at like, you know, seven or eight, nine, 10 years old, like actually writing the storylines of my action figures as if like I took my GI Joes and made them into like a GI Joe series. And I would be writing down what happened so I could review the next week I played with the GI Joes. Uh, so yeah, I, I was kind of a weird child in that way, <laughs> but uh, it really helped me develop the uh, the ability to storytell. I've always been a fan of film. Always, be, I've read as long as I could recognize word on a, words on a page, and I've just been really passionate about music, especially music by lyricists that tell stories about character and and uh, and and something that goes on. You know, not that I don't love a great ACDC song, which in three minutes is just about like drinking, you know, <laughs> meeting ladies and stuff like that. But I always appreciate a great like Tom Petty style story song, like Into the Great Wide Open. Um, so that's really where I kind of recognized it. And professionally, though, I really didn't get into it until I was in college and you had the opportunities to write for different outlets. Uh, you know, at that time, you know, the internet was kind of percolating. So people were, you know, anybody who had a website was looking for anybody who was willing to write on a website. And eventually you meet somebody that actually wants to pay you to do it. And you're like, oh my goodness, someone's going to pay me to do something I like to do. And, uh, you know, it kind of has just built from ever, ever since there, from getting a few bucks for an article to, you know, now writing books and going into the bookstore and seeing my name on them. <laughs> okay. So you, you, you said two things back to back that I had two questions with each one of those things. And it's so, the, 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 my first qu comment was, is it surreal to look back and go, wait a minute, I'm actually getting paid to do something I love to do, which I used to do with my G.I. Joe action figure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because it's just, it's so, you know, I always, a lot, of, a lot of the stuff I did to write is because I just, I, it was just an outlet for me. And to have that validation that, that somebody else is willing to put it out and someone beyond your family. I love my family, but family <laughs> tends to like everything you do. You know, um, if my books weren't published, my mom would probably print them out and put them <laughs> on the refrigerator, you know, um, which is great. My mother loves me though, but that validation of total strangers, people that don't know that say, Hey, I read your book. I loved it. It was great. And having a publisher say, I actually want to buy this from you and put it on a bookshelf so other people can enjoy it. It's just the craziest thing. And, and uh, you know, uh, something that I 
probably, you know, something I always wanted, but never believed would actually happen. And that goes to my part two with your, your two last sentences. When you said you walk into a bookstore and see your book on a shelf, that's got to be mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, especially knowing that there's bookstores are, are unfortunately few and far between these days. Right. Um, so I remember I was out in L.A. when my Rolling Stones book came out and I went to a Barnes and Noble and my book was on the shelf and I couldn't help it. But I opened up one of the copies and wrote the author was here and signed it and put it back on the shelf. <laughs> oh, oh, my that's God. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, I got to say is I thought that that was really clever. But then as I was leaving, I go, you know, they may open it. You know, someone may open it and be like, there's graffiti in this book. We got to get rid of it. You know, send it back to the publisher. <laughs> so I hope somebody uh, who went to the uh, Barnes and Noble and Studio City bought the book and has found my signature. But if not, go now. It may still be there on the shelf. Wow. You should have put your Twitter handle and say, if you found this, hit me up. You know, I didn't even think about that, but you know, if I find my petty book on uh, on a bookshelf, <laughs> I'll do that, uh, and and I'll credit I'll credit Wilder Ride. Excellent. Well, Walt, I know you want to get a word in edgewise because you're the one who actually stumbled uh, across uh, Christopher and across his book, and you know, we're both Tom Petty fans. So, uh, what was it? That, how did you stumble across Christopher? Well, I I believe that it was another Tom Petty fan had posted something. And we ended up somehow in this thread and I had clicked on him and, and followed and I saw that he was an author and looked him up and I was like, oh my gosh, I've, I, this, is, this book looks like a genius book. And one of the questions I had for you, Christopher, was when I first looked at it and realized that you kind of took that, um, that box of time from the time, and, and obviously you weren't hard and fast, you gave a little bit of the... Uh, earlier life of Tom and and the band, but you really focus on that time when he came to LA and and forward. What made you decide to uh, to do that in those time frames and in the in the geography? Because you also did that in your other book, "Can't Give It Away" on Seventh Avenue about the Rolling Stones and their time in New York. What inspired you to write in that time frame? So. This goes back to the first book, which, as you mentioned, was Can't Give It Away on 7th Avenue. Um, I grew up in New York, uh, if you couldn't tell from the accent, uh, but I grew up uh, in New York and I always was, was kind of, in, I love the Rolling Stones and I was always kind of into this, curious about all of the major events that happened with the Rolling Stones in New York City. They used to launch their their tours with with big promotional events in New York City. Uh, in in seventy five, they they played on a flatbed truck down down uh, Fifth Avenue singing Brown Sugar. Uh, in eighty nine, they did a huge press conference at at Grand Central Terminal. Um, they've written so many songs about New York, and they've written uh, you know they they've done a little bit of recording in New York. Had some of their biggest concert moments in New York and including their their uh, live album, uh, Get Your Yaya's Out. And I was, it always just kind of, kind of interested me as a fan of the band and as a fan of history. I'm a tremendous fan of history to find out, well, what's the connection? This is a band from, from across the pond. They're not from New York. Why do they feel New York is such a, a big part of their identity? And, uh, you know, I just started researching and writing down every everything and then trying to figure out how that connected to what was going on in the city and the culture of at that time. Um, you know, it's it's kind of wild to see how Los Angeles and New York City has have changed over the decades. You know, there's certain things that kind of fit in your memory of New York or Los Angeles, you know, the landmarks, the Empire State Building, the Hollywood sign, but the actual face of the city, of those cities and the culture of those cities have changed tremendously. And putting that through the lens of an artist who, who works and has worked in that city and performed in that city, I, I personally find fascinating because you can tell the history of that city through the artist's work and the artist's response to what was going on at the time. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because I've lived in both, but New York and LA are kind of the, you know, seen as the media capitals of the United States, if not the world. So those, 
you know, the Stones and Petty to me seem like the right artists to make those make that uh, exploration, mainly because neither one of them are originally from those cities. Um, everyone has asked me now, is your next book going to be, you know, Bruce Springsteen in New Jersey? And I'm like, that, no, because <laughs> that, that doesn't interest me as much. I feel like people have a lot of most people have a natural connection to their hometown. Um, but coming from some other place and establishing yourself and establishing your voice in a place that's foreign to you, I think is, is so much more interesting to me. Well, I think that is one of the things about Tom Petty that has always been interesting to me. He of course is from Florida and he moved to LA and wanted to establish himself as an LA guy, but he still harkens back so often to his Southern roots. I mean, he even has the song Southern Accent uh, in Rebels. He talks about, you know, obviously a North and South, uh, you know, the North and South attitudes between, um, you know, uh, the verses there. So he he still has those Southern roots and his music still has that Southern sound to it in a lot of ways. Uh, but he really did try to establish himself as a California musician. Yes, that's correct. He really saw the Heartbreakers as part of the Southern California tradition of uh, Buffalo Springfield and the birds and everything that was going in the Laurel Canyon scene of the 70s. He really believed that's because the Heartbreakers, even though they all were tied to Gainesville, Florida, they the band didn't form until they were all in Los Angeles. And Tom Petty used to get so annoyed if he wasn't, if the Heartbreakers were not considered a Florida band, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, an LA band. Um, There's kind of a famous, uh, well, not super famous, but I loved writing about it in my book about how the LA Times once low rated the Heartbreakers on the list of best LA bands of all time. And Tom Petty was furious about this because he felt that points were deducted because he was from, you know, because he's originally from Florida. He was especially annoyed because the number one band on the list was The Doors and Jim Morrison was from Florida. Right. So he's saying, wait, how come Jim Morrison gets a pass because of his you know, freaky poetry from Venice Beach? But I don't get a pass because I'm from Florida. So he was really it was really important for him for the Heartbreakers to be seen in that tradition. And, uh, you know, he would argue at every chance that the Heartbreakers, their home territory was was L.A. But you're absolutely right he never fully turned his back on the, the music of the South. I mean, I mean, his earliest musical memory was meeting Elvis Presley in, which is kind of a wild story when he was a little kid. Um, and that Memphis sort of sound was, was really, you know, could be heard throughout his music as well as, you know, he, uh, he did come from the same era of, of Leonard Skinner, you know, uh, so it's kind of interesting. You'll find people sometimes call Tom Petty Southern rock, which is not the right label. Um, but what are labels anyway? You know, one one man's Southern rock is another man's, you know, blues rock, Allman Brothers kind of thing. But yeah, isn't that the problem? That's the problem with labels. Labels start, may start making you feel like you're pigeonholed into a corner. And I, don't, I would not I would not want to put Tom Petty in a corner anywhere. Right. <laughs> well, and one of the things that you made a point of that I thought was really interesting, I'd never, I, it had never occurred to me that you could put him in this category, but that somebody had labeled him as punk because he was wearing a black jacket on one of his albums and, uh, and kind of running around at that time. And I think the quote was something like, if you call me punk again, I'll cut you. Yeah. And I, I thought that was really funny because I never would have put him in that category. Oh, even yeah. I, well, guess I, what? Uh, One of my very first albums growing up as a wee little kid advertised on uh, three payments of five ninety nine was the <laughs> Chipmunk Punk album featuring a cover <laughs> of Refugee by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Really? Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yeah, it was a it was a it was, a, it was an out my first record that I remember my mom buying for us, and it was a, a television commercial that would come on during Saturday morning cartoons and then you know afternoon cartoons. And of course, being little and, and loving the, the Chipmunks, I got the Chipmunk Punk album, and Refugee was one of the first songs I knew off that album. <laughs> that is really funny. The, and, that, and what's funny about it is the album you're referring to with the leather jacket was the very first Heartbreakers album, uh, which self-titled Tom Petty and right. the Heartbreakers came out in 76. And you have to think of the context of music, the music genres that were popular in 76. You got disco and 
Refugee is certainly, you know, uh, you know, the, the albums, uh, the two big songs on the al- on that album, Breakdown and American Girl, they ain't disco. Uh, New Wave was kind of emerging and, and it's there. It, Tom Petty's not really New Wave. There's not a lot of not no. a lot of stuff going on there that would make you think of like the cars or something like that, um, as much as I love the cars. Um even though he did open for Blondie at the Whiskey A Go Go several times. Yes, absolutely. By the way, Blondie was another on the Chipmunk Punk album with Call Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think for some people they were trying to put him in a category, and punk, you know, just seemed to be the 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 only choice that fit at that time because you know there the you know and that's that's where he ended up and but that was another thing that that really annoyed him because he's not he's like we're not punk music we're rock and roll and that's what we right. do it was almost too early to call him this but I, you know you could argue more for a progressive rock than you know punk rock yeah oh definitely um certainly i mean and but again if you say progressive rock you know people start thinking of early genesis you know or rush you know and stuff like that so and right. it's not quite that and maybe that's what made or i would argue actually it's one of the things that made Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, such a memorable band is they really defied a lot of the categories and, and really had their own sound that, uh, that people could respond to. And and you could recognize, yeah, that's a Tom Petty song and not be like, wait, is this quiet riot or rat? I can't tell. (laughs) Right. Right. No, they, they definitely were not ever, ever confused with any of the hair bands of the eighties. It was just the first ones I thought of. No, no, but you're right though. Um, I always think of like how Quiet Riot tried to be like the L.A. version of uh, the Scorpions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's actually a, a pretty, pretty apt comparison. Yeah. And it's it's sort of interesting to see, you know, because there's definitely these these pockets of music genres where everybody kind of sounds very similar. But then you have people like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers that exist sort of outside those bubbles. They They can cross over into those bubbles a little bit, but they're really kind of their own thing. Well, and one of the things that stood out to me as I was reading, and I had I never really put these on a timeline to think about it, but you did have New Wave coming out. You had the Ramones. You had some bands like that. And then you had Van Halen and some other bands kind of in that harder rock genre. And then you had Tom Petty. And so he he really was that Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers was a hard band to put in any of those categories. That's correct. Absolutely. Hard band to put in any of those categories. And again, that's why I think maybe that's why when you hear a Tom Petty song, you kind of go, yep, that's Tom Petty. Well, and when you look at who is influencing influencing him, he was spending a lot of time with people like Leon Russell, who was definitely not in any of those other categories. And then that long list of people, he you know hung out with um, some of the guys from the Beach Boys and all these other bands. So he really did have some interesting influences while, while he was in LA. Yeah. And, and on top of that, um, yeah, so that occurred. So Tom Petty came to Cal- California initially with his first band out of Gainesville, or not his first band, but his, his first real major band called Mud Crutch. And they arrived in LA and started recording for Shelter Records, which at the time was co-owned by Leon Russell. And they put out one single, and it didn't do anything. It it just kind of disappeared as soon as they they put it out there. And you know, Mud Crutch for whatever reason they were super successful in Gainesville, but just could not get their act together in Los Angeles. So Mud Crutch was dismissed off their record contract. But Tom Petty was retained by Shelter because they saw potential of him as a songwriter and stuck him with Leon Russell. And said, hey, maybe you guys can get together, write some tunes. And during that period, that was when Tom Petty started to meet all of these major rock and roll stars. You mentioned Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, George Harrison, Ringo Starr. And all of a sudden he goes, wait, whoa, I'm meeting a lot of major people. And I think that's part of the reason why later in his career, Tom Petty was like a go-to guy for collaborations. He worked with Del Shannon. He, of course, did the Traveling Wilburys group with George Harrison and Roy Orbison and Bob Dylan. Uh, and he went on that major tour with Bob Dylan in the 80s, um, which which the Heartbreakers pl- were Dylan's backing, ba- backing band. He did an incredible album with Johnny Cash and Rick Rubin. I mean, he was just a guy that was always willing to collaborate with rock and roll greats uh, because he had such respect for for these for these influences 
You know, it's funny you you, you mentioned that because I was going to get into the the traveling Wilbur as we started talking about people ha- he's hanging out with, and I'm thinking like Jeff Lynn, ELO, Roy Orbison, George Harrison of the Beatles, you know, Bob Dylan, uh, you know, folk icon, you know, character, Jim uh, Keltner on the drums. I mean, you create this group like a super group of all these amazing people and yet they all feel like they're all equals and it's just amazing to me that how did tom petty work his way in there (laughs) well the famous story of the formation of the traveling wilburys is that george harrison had been working with jeff lynn uh and jeff lynn had produced harrison's sort of comeback album cloud nine uh which had the the great single i got my mind set on you and the record company said we need a we need a b-side and for those kids that don't know what a B-side is, that was <laughs> the other side of the record when you had a single. Um, and the record company said, we need a B-side. We need you to record an original song. So George Harrison and Jeff Lynne that day happened to be having lunch with Roy Orbison. And, you know, George said, hey, Roy, would, would you like to, to be on, on my single, you know, or on my B-side? And Roy Orbison said, Sure. And Jeff Lynn said, well, I don't know if we can book a studio in this time. Maybe we could do it at Bob's house. And Roy's like, yeah, 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 sure. Sounds good. Well, Roy Orbison didn't realize they meant Bob Dylan's house. They just, he just figured it was a guy named Bob that had a studio. (laughs) Hey, Bob. (laughs) And the pizza guy, you know, down the street. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Uh, And, and, uh, and, and Tom Petty got involved because George Harrison had left his guitar at Tom Petty's house during a jam session or whatever. And he showed up to, to, to Tom Petty's house and, and picked up his guitar and said, Hey, uh, you know, I'm doing a session tomorrow with Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynn and Bob Dylan. Do you think you'd want to come along? And Tom <laughs> Petty said, yeah, I think I could make that work. And yeah, that's how they ended up. And they recorded this song called handle with care, uh, which they got off. They got the title off a box that was in uh, Bob Dylan's garage. Um, and they ended up recording the song and Warner Brothers, which was Harrison's label at the time, said, you can't just do one song with these guys. You guys got to do an album. And luckily they worked it out. They found time in everyone's schedule and they were able to do it. But yeah, it was one of those sort of things that everything just happened to fall in place. And after Roy Orbison died after the first Wilburys album, um, there was all this speculation in the media, like who is going to replace him? Who's going to be who's going to be the new Wilbury? And it was funny because to the members of the of the group, the other four guys, they said, we never thought we'd replace Orbison because this just kind of happened as it came together. You can't just add someone to the mix now. There's, you know, you, it's the it was the five of us. Now it's the four of us. You know, we, we go on. Um, but yeah, just sort of a wild story that just kind of all came together um, and, and, and great because both of those Wilburys album are just so fun to listen to. One of the things I've always been amazed about with that group is – when you take people with that level of talent and success and put them all in a room, you you know that it's either going to go one direction or another. It's either going to be awesome or it's going to be a train wreck. And it was really one of the most amazing groups of people to put together. And the chemistry was just fantastic. And nearly every song on both albums are just awesome. Yeah, I agree. And it's funny because you look at that and you see all those people together. And, you know, some of these people, we, we'd like to think they don't have egos, but of course they're rock stars. They, they definitely have to have some degree of egos. And you wonder, you know, if, if these five guys could work together, man, why did it take Guns N' Roses like 25 years to, to uh-huh. you know, for Axel and Slash to just have a conversation, you know, like how does, how does this work? But, you know, it's, it, it is pretty incredible to see that. And it's rare. It's definitely rare in rock and roll to see something like that. You know, super groups, true super groups really don't come along too often because, yeah, egos get involved and, you know, um, it just doesn't work out. Well, when you sat down and wrote this book, did you really intentionally say, this is the book I'm going to write? I'm going to write the uh, the book on the Rolling Stones in New York. I'm going to write the book on Tom Petty in L.A. Or did that just kind of come together for you? Well, the Rolling Stones one was extremely intentional because that was a book I had been working on in my head and 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 just drafting because it was a story I really wanted to tell. Um, after I, you know, I had managed to find an agent who actually believed in what I was doing, uh, which to me was a miracle. And then that my agent found a publisher that was willing to put the book out, which I believe was the second miracle. Um, uh, 
you know, they said, you know, we'd love to see you do uh, a book about uh, about an, a, another city, another star. We love the the format that you did here. You know, not that we want to do a series, but but we still feel that there's there's another book here. And we kicked around some ideas with the publisher, um, but really the one that I thought of immediately was Tom Petty in Los Angeles because I was I'm a huge Petty fan. I know of his connection to the city, and uh, part of it also came out of that. Uh, it, the book was first kind of being thought of right after Tom Petty passed away, which which you guys were talking about in the introduction, and. I at the time I was living in Los Angeles and it was just such an outpouring of 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 grief in the city and and you could really sense the love and the connection between Tom Petty and Los Angeles after it happened it was it was very similar to a couple of years later when Kobe Bryant passed away mm. um because it was just this the city this you could feel that the city was hurting over the over a loss um and that 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 was just something that stuck in my brain. And I said, okay, there's a similar connection here. Um, so it definitely took for me a bit more research and diving into because, uh, you know, as a native New Yorker, I was intimately aware of all of, the, of all of this that was going on. You know, I was living in Los Angeles, but had personally a, less of a connection. But in that sense, I kind of felt like Tom Petty because I was from somewhere else and trying to create a work of art well, I don't know if it's art, but work of uh, work of accomplishment here in a city that I was still relatively unfamiliar with. Well, L.A. is kind of a weird city in that way and that everybody moves there. You know, you, you I was uh, I was out there a few years ago and I'm standing eating lunch and the guy next to me is wearing an Atlanta Braves hat. And we sat and talked for 10 minutes about the Atlanta Braves. He had moved out. He was a sound guy in the in the uh, movie industry. So he was just saying that it's easy to find people from all over the country. Atlanta is kind of that way too. We we're kind of a conglomeration of people from everywhere else. And uh so that has to be I mean in a sense you're almost an LA person because you came from somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I always joke about that's why LA didn't have a football team from like 94 until mm. last year, because uh, I mean, they had it previously, but in that gap, because everybody cheers from for the team that they, where they came from, you know, and, and you have no problem finding a bar where it's a uh, Eagles bar or a, or a Patriots bar or a, or uh, you know a Seahawks bar, you could find them all over LA because there's people just kind of find each other. You know, especially now with the internet, just like everyone who's a Seahawks fan meet at this bar um, for the game. And I think that's that. You know, I I, I used to love going to Dodgers games, um, and it was always interesting to see how many away fans were at Dodgers games because it was all people that moved to LA for various reasons and saying, "Oh my goodness, my team's playing the Dodgers. Got to go to the game." That's interesting. We, we we have some of that here. You'll go to a Braves game and 30% of the people there will be wearing the opposing team stuff, especially when it's L.A., if, if you're playing the Dodgers or you're playing the Cubs uh, or uh, the Mets uh, or the Reds. You'll have a lot of those fans. <laughs> Any other so, major market city. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's crazy. I, I mean, it, it's insane. So um, So how hard was it to do the research that you needed to do for this book? So the starting point for, for both of them is there, there's when it comes to Tom Petty books, there are, you know, three gospels of Tom Petty books. Uh, one most recently released was uh, by a, a fellow named John Scott. And if you're not familiar with John Scott, he's the reason why people know who Tom Petty is, because John Scott was uh, was a and uh, uh, was in promotions uh, when the Heartbreakers recorded their first album. And he's the guy that heard Breakdown and said, you know what? I think this is a great record. And he, and he went to the various radio stations in LA and he said, you got to play this. You got to play this. Um, he ran into Tom Petty at the whiskey as they were up and coming uh, whiskey, a go, go out in LA and said, uh, Hey, Heartbreakers guys, I'm going to get your song on the radio. And they basically said, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Um, he did. And that was really the guy who got it going. So he has a book called Tom Petty and me. That was a great book to start research and, and kind of get a feel for the, the, to, the time and the place when all this was going on. Tom Petty has two official biographies. One is Petty the Biography, um, and another is Conversations with Tom Petty. And both of those books are really good on filling out the, the basics of the details. Uh, or, or And I, I quote them um, in, in the book as well. But really, and 
this is where I'm one of those weird people that loves research and investigation. Although, you know, you're a private investigator, so maybe, maybe we're not that weird. Um, no, you're weird. <laughs> we're, we're weird. Yeah. So, you know, those are, those are great starting points, but I don't want to do the same thing that those books are doing. I dig into a lot of the magazines and the newspaper accounts of when this stuff happened. And the reason why I do that is because what I learned, especially when working on my stone, on the stones book is rock and roll out of maybe any other uh, popular art form is really prone to mythologizing and embellishing stories and making things sound utterly fantastic and and, uh, because you know it just goes with the image of the rock star Um, when i was researching my stones book you, you just i would just come across so many things that just couldn't have possibly happened based on either the context of the time or where the the stones were in the world there was this one person who wrote a story and I don't even want to mention their name because it was just so full of full full of BS but he he wrote a story about confronting Keith Richards at Cafe Wa in New York and threatening him with a gun well the stones were on tour in Europe at the time when the guy tells this story so he may have thought he ran into Keith Richards but it was probably just another guy on drugs you know what do I know <laughs> um, but you know and that's the kind of stuff you come you come across when you're doing this sort of research so I love digging into like the primary sources of of like the news the local newspapers that were saying like this hot new band Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and half of the names are spelled wrong because you know you know nobody nobody knows who these guys are yet uh talking about their their uh you know first shows and and you know they may have potential but you know going on that's the stuff that I find fascinating because this is the, the these are the accounts of when it actually happened the primary sources um you know, and it's it's easy to see because, like I said, there's there's a lot of mythologizing that goes in, in rock and roll and, and sort of retelling the same stories over and over again. Um, famously, uh, when it comes to the Rolling Stones in particular, there's the, uh, the, the, the very famous moment where they appeared on the Ed Sullivan show and had to edit the lyrics of their song let's spend the night together because that was too racy for 1967 uh to let's spend some time together um and and jagger of course sang those lyrics rolling his eyes on the television screen well um the way the stones tell that story is that they were told like three minutes before they went on stage that they had to change the lyrics um the truth is that the day before it was announced in the newspaper, hey, parents, don't worry. The Stones are performing that, that racy new song of theirs, but they're going to change the lyrics so you can watch it with your kids. So it was announced in the newspaper. So clearly the management had negotiated this days ahead of time. But it's a cooler story to be, hey, I was a rebel <laughs> and I was yeah. told. You know, Jagger even says in interviews that, oh, I never said, let's spend some time together. I just mumbled. Well, the video exists. You can hear what he says, but you know, again, it's it's part of the mythology of rock and roll, and you know, we 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 think of these the, these figures larger than life, you know, and and it's easy to believe, you know, it, it it's the same reason why no matter how many years go by, we're still going to hear stories of Keith Richards is got a full blood transfusion in Switzerland, which really didn't happen, or or Gene Simmons uh, uh, got a tongue implant because that's why his tongue is so long, which didn't <laughs> happen. You know, you, sh- you just hear these stories because they're cool stories, but that's not necessarily how things happened. Well, I was going to ask you, as you were doing the research, were there any stories that you went after that you were disappointed to find out that they weren't what they had initially been told as? So the the one one big famous story about Tom Petty and and uh, Petty the biography really dug this out a lot, but there's other sources that that led to it. The, one of the famous stories about Tom Petty is that he uh, uh, damn the torpedoes, which you mentioned before. Before that album was re- released. Tom Petty's record contract had been sold to another label um, because Shelter Records went out of went out of business. Tom Petty said, "No, my contract should be null and void. You can't sell me to another record label. My, if you, if you go out of business, so does the contract." And this became a prolonged prolonged legal battle where Tom Petty actually declared bankruptcy uh, because declaring bankruptcy can 
wiggle you out of some of your financial obligations. Um, for decades, the story was that Tom Petty was really totally out of money. He was tapped out. He was, you know, you'd hear people be like he was him and his family were living out of their car, you know, and stuff like that. Um, truth of the matter is um, that that was more of a bargaining tactic than anything else because declaring bankruptcy does get you out of financial obligations. And the concern from the record label standpoint was, oh, shoot, if this is a kind of a get out of contract free card for artists and Tom Petty does it, who's the next one who's going to do it? And soon we're going to have every every artist who doesn't want to get out of his or her contract, just making it null and void by saying, I'm bankrupt, you know, um, which I know bankruptcy laws are a little more complicated than this, but I'm kind of, you know, just trying to trying to get to the bone. So so that really hero of the people story is is not quite as <laughs> quite as like, you know, uh, as as dire as as it was presented as originally was. But uh, I mean, it's still a cool story. It's just not as quite the the, the knight in shining shining bankruptcy armor to 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 that that's been told over the years. So as a as a writer, as a somebody trying to capture the 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 feeling of of Tom Petty and the and the feeling of the heartbreakers and sort of the the mythology as you will as you were you're kind of saying because there is a mythology around rock ba- singers and bands. Uh, what was sort of like the the avenues for either, you know, stories of fans or stories from the radio. Like how did you collect sort of the feeling versus the facts that you would read in the newspaper? All right. Excellent. Uh, really one of the greatest ways to, to go about this is, is thank, thank goodness for the internet for this, for this very reason. Um, it's so easy to find people that are into Tom Petty or the Rolling Stones or any other band to just kind of pick their brains on what they think is important or stories that they think are, are, are important or, or their memories and their feelings of what was going on. Because certainly I wasn't at a lot of these concerts that happened. You know, I, you know, I can listen a lot of times you can find the bootlegs and stuff like that of, of what came out and some people were even able to offer me bootlegs that they made of concerts they went to which was kind of cool to hear you know they were like i recorded this back in 82 and you're like that's awesome um <laughs> how did you get a tape recorder in there because those things were giant back in 82 um but uh it's it's really co- it was really cool to be able to outreach to people and, and get them to, to get their memories and of course memory is 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 also a little challenging so it's kind of finding that that balance of people's memories uh people that that had um connections with with what was going on at the time uh and balancing that with 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 the research in newspapers magazines and so on so what did you find most maybe compelling doing sort of the the I try to put the right words around it, but the the feel of the van, band because it's easy to get where they were, when they were there, how long they were there, when did their albums come out. You can do all of the you know the, the hard you know fact checking, but as far as what was something either surprising or just interesting that you discovered, either emotionally about the band or sort of the, the mythology as you were saying earlier. What what was some of the things that just struck you? Because a lot of times I'm imagining you think you know everything until you start really digging. I think what really surprised me, and, and I say this as somebody who considered himself a really big Tom Petty fan, uh, what surprised me was how passionate Tom Petty was about his fan base. Because, you know, fans are always passionate about a band but or, or an actor or any famous figure. But the love's not always, not always. It's it's typically not the same e- either way. Um, you know, one of the other famous stories about Tom Petty is that his his album after Damn the Torpedoes, Hard Promises, the record label wanted to put it out with a premium price tag because he was Damn the Torpedoes sold a bunch of copies and they want to capitalize that. And he really fought the record label and it was only a dollar price range, but it was, you know, back in the early eighties. So that's not insignificant amount of money. Um, but he knew that, that, that would be inaccessible for some of his fans. And it was sort of incredible that even in the, towards the end of the heartbreakers career in the, in the, you know, 2010s, I guess that's what we call it. 2010s. Um, 
you know, they would go on tour and their concert tickets were always cheaper than a lot of their major star contemporaries. I mean, you know, you think of like Prince or Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty tickets were always significantly less. And it was because Tom Petty's management, and I did not know this, uh, would go out and negotiate deals venue by venue, as opposed to working with a giant, you know, uh, you know, tour management company, uh, because they wanted to try to get the lowest possible ticket price and of course still make a profit for their fans um which is certainly not something that the rolling stones do the rolling stones are like whatever if it's 500 bucks our fans will pay it you know what we don't care um and that was something i didn't know and and there was something that a lot of petty super fans were really familiar with and they were like you know i i love that i could go see four or five shows on 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 a tour and not feel like i shelled out two thousand dollars to do so you know i was able to do it you know and and and, and see in pretty pretty good seats you know and not feel ripped off and you know that i i definitely built a lot of respect out of that because of course i know it's important to make make it's imp- you got to make money i get it you know i certainly don't i don't uh I don't um, knock the stones for selling face masks with the tongue logo on it. You know, I get it. Uh, it's kind of clever, actually. But, uh, you know, I got to respect that 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 an artist that's willing to go to bat for his fans when he could probably just do whatever he wants and they'd pay for it. That is a really cool story. And it could easily be something he just didn't pay attention to. You know, not my job. Let somebody else deal with that. But he stayed involved in every aspect of his music and its relationship to his fans all the way through to the end of his life. Yeah, I mean, and and that final tour, the 2017 40th anniversary tour, you know, the sad thing about really sad about that. And again, something that not everyone certainly was aware of until until after is that he was in a tremendous amount of pain, but felt obligated to do the tour for his fans because it was the 40th anniversary tour. Um, he just, he felt, he felt obligated and he didn't, he, he was a guy who, who rarely canceled shows even when he wasn't feeling that great. And, you know, I think though every fan would be like, wish you would have canceled or postponed and taken some time for yourself to recover from your injuries. Yeah. You know, it, it sort of in that sense reminds me of probably one of my all time favorite bands, the rush when they were doing their final tour and Neil Piart was like, my arthritis is killing me. I know the cancer's back, but this is it. I'm going to give everybody the show of their lives. And, you know, I get, I get that, you know, just the love of the fan base and wanting to do it for them. And that is such a cool thing. And I think some of the bands that maybe survive those, those inner turmoils and the, and, and the, and the ego fights is maybe they, they never forget that if it's not for the fans, they wouldn't exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's another example. Rush is a perfect example of another band that has a passionate fan base that, that, that respects what they, what they do. And, and, and Rush is, is similar in, in, in the Heartbreakers where they sense that, that love and appreciation and, and totally are totally give it back, totally accept it and give it back. I'm curious, did you learn things like, what are the bands that Tom Petty liked or what were the or the things he was interested in besides, you know, his music and his fans. And, you know, sometimes we forget that these are human beings too. that like to maybe sit back and binge watch TV shows or, you know, kick back and listen to the latest, whatever album. Did you ever get a sense of any of his likes? Yeah. So uh, Tom Petty was a tremendous fan of movies, which uh, was maybe yet another reason why he moved out to Hollywood. But uh, one of the things that I thought was really funny that I learned was that he when he was on tour, he would request that they only go in hotels that had Turner classic movies on the, on, on the, on the channels, because he would watch that just constantly. He'd love watching old movies and he would it would just be like, Hey, check all the, the, and I can imagine, you know, whoever's putting these tours together have to call up individual hotels. <laughs> Do you have TCM on the dial? You know, um, but that was something that he that that was really important to him uh, because he was just a, a storyteller himself. And I think that actually ties into the Heartbreakers career on how successful they were with the visual aspects of their music videos in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, because one of the things that really set Tom Petty apart as an artist is those clever, inventive music videos that he did with the Heartbreakers, uh, you know, uh, dressing up as the Mad Hatter in, in, uh, in uh, Don't Come Around Here No More. Um, and in fact, the video for you got, You've Got, you got Lucky 
um, was the first, which is kind of like this Mad Max apocalyptic inspired video. It was the first music video that actually had like a minute long, like intro to the video that kind of set up what was going on. Uh, this was before Michael Jackson and, and all that started doing like, you know, multi minute long, you know, mini epic, you know, music videos. This was the first one that, that really told the kind of a story with an intro and it's kind of cool to see that, that, that he was such a big fan of film that he, that he's like, you know, I want to turn these music videos into like a mini movie and not just us standing there playing because that gets boring. Um, and, uh, yeah, so him as a tremendous movie buff was, was, was surprising to me, but makes total sense now that I think of it. Well, you talk about a, a Mad Max esque background. Is that what got him in the postman with Kevin Costner? Possibly. Yeah. I think I, I remember reading, you know, it's, it's just sort of funny that he was kind of not doing anything. And, you know, as a rock star g gets offers all the time and, you know, he got to film that up in the Pacific Northwest and, you know, beautiful, you know, country. And he was just like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. Sure. And they're <laughs> like, yeah, essentially you play yourself and that's right. about it. <laughs> and he's like, okay, all right. Sounds good. Shouldn't and be hard. Yeah. Well, it's funny because he it seems like a lot of stuff happened because he wasn't doing anything. He's hanging out at home and then he ends up in the traveling wilderberries. He is not doing anything, so he ends up in this movie. Uh I mean, he for a guy who was that busy all the time, he kind of stumbled into some stuff just by not being busy. Or uh, you know, another perfect example is he voiced the character Lucky on the TV show King of the Hill. Oh yeah. And he just did that because they wrote, uh, you know, they wrote, they wrote a character, this, this guy, Lucky, who's, you know, really sort of backwards, woods, rednecky. And he was described in the screenplay of the episode as Tom Petty without the success. The, uh, the producers of the show say, well, you, you want to see if Tom Petty will do it? And they're like, all right. So they pitched it. And he, he just thought it was hilarious that, 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 that was the way the character was described, did the episode. And he goes, Hey, if you guys ever want me to do another episode, I'm happy to do it. And he ended up becoming a recurring character. And, and, and towards the end of the series, like a main character on the series and Tom Petty voiced him every single time. And, and just, and again, this is a guy that that's got much, much more lucrative things to do with his rock band and concert tours and, you know, playing the Super Bowl and things like that. But no, I, I want to do this cartoon show on Fox because it's fun. It makes me <laughs> laugh. Well, you know what? It's, isn't that nice, though? You can get to a point in your career where you don't forget it's okay to have fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what's that like? <laughs> uh, don't ask me. <laughs> I I hope to one day know. <laughs> well, Chris, you you obviously have these two books. Do you have any other books that you've worked on as well? Yeah, so I've uh, prior. These are the first two books that I released that were actually like fully my books with my name on the cover and all that. Previous to this, I, I, I contributed to a lot of collections and shorter pieces, kind of working my way up. Um, one of my favorites that I did was uh, there was a book that came up that said uh, 100 Americans that changed pop culture. And I, I wrote five of the entries in there. And and one of them, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head what they were. Uh, one was Billy Wilder, who, uh, if you're not familiar with the name, was director of just some incredible Hollywood films like Some Like It Hot and uh, Sunset Boulevard and really was one of the the, the guys who, who, who kind of pushed the envelope back when things were very restrictive. Uh, I, I wrote about uh, Jerry Siegel and uh, George uh, Joe, Joe Schuster, who are the creators of Superman, because really they created the superhero, which dominates our pop culture these days. Um, I wrote about Howard Stern, who really was a major uh, influence on anybody who's ever been on radio since him uh, or podcasts or things like that. Um, and uh, Jim Henson, who oh, I, yeah. I think yeah. was just such a creative genius in so many ways and, 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 you know, often gets overlooked because, you know, you don't really know his face as much because he was always behind Kermit or Ernie or some other character. But, uh, you know, and that's such a, I, I always take a lot of pride in that book because that's such an eclectic group of people, you know, uh, but I, but I'm passionate about every single one. So I just kind of pitched all five of them and, and sure enough, I got them. Um, and, and they were happy to include them. Um, so yeah, that, and I've, I also do a lot of writing on the internet for various different outlets. Um, one of my favorite things I've ever written, uh, was for a pop culture, uh, website called, uh, 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 it's called, uh, little white lies. And it is, 
it, it I, I wrote it and it's a, it's a movie. Uh, it's a movie magazine that comes out of the UK. And I wrote an article about this uh, Frank Stallone, Sylvester Stallone movie that was, that was shot in Florida in 1997 and never got released because of all these legal problems, because this was just like a Frank Stallone project that somehow he got his brother to come in on. Um, and uh, the story behind it um, was that uh, Frank Stallone begged or I assume begged uh, Sylvester Stallone to, to make like a five minute cameo in the movie. And then when this movie's first like trailer came out, the entire trailer focused on Sylvester Stallone, who's in the movie for like, you know, a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, lawsuits happened. And this movie had like some pretty big names like Dennis Hopper and David Carradine, uh, people who are no longer here with us, but it's still like locked up in the vaults because in the vault because it's so entangled. Um, and what was really cool about that is I got to talk to people that worked on the film and some of them saying like, I forgot I even worked on that project. <laughs> you called wow. me out of the blue and I'm like, holy, that movie never came out. And I worked like months on it. And then I had one guy that goes, I don't even think I got paid for that movie. And I was like, well, leave <laughs> I go, I go, leave me out of that one. I got nothing to do with that. Um, but that was just, that was just wild to just do research on that because um, you, it, it was just, it was just so crazy to hear these stories about this, this, this movie, because they, 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 they started in Florida, they ran out of money, they moved to Mexico, uh, and they were shooting it on a golf course in Mexico, but they had to keep stopping because these alligators kept coming out after them or, or crocodiles. I don't know which live in Mexico, alligators or crocodiles. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, just this wild story. And that, that's sort of stuff I just had a joy writing because it's like, this is a story that's never been told. And it's something that I wouldn't have believed it unless I talked to these people myself. That's amazing. That whole story really does sound like a Frank Stallone production, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Just a total disaster from start to finish. And, and that was on the website Little White Lies? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to have to look that up. Well, Christopher, as we start to make our way toward the end of the interview segment, one of the things we always do with our guests is sort of, uh, you know, because it, it is a moment by moment and spent a lot of time talking about the book and specifically the most recent one about Tom Petty. But what's next? Where are you going from here? What, what can uh, listeners who are not only intrigued enough to go get your book now that might decide, okay, I want to follow this guy. What's he going to do next? So uh, if you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter, which is at Chris McKit, C-H-R-I-S-M-C-K-I-T. And also my website is the same thing, chrismckit.com, C-H-R-I-S-M-C-K-I-T. And... Um, that's where you can primarily find out what I'm going right now. I'm really concentrating on promoting this book uh, because it just came out a few weeks ago. I am working on other, uh, another book, a proposal that I, I want to put out there uh, very shortly. Um, that's not the same. Cause again, everyone's like, well, is it, what is it? Is it, is it Bob Dylan in Nashville? Is it, you know, and I'm like, no, it's not, we're getting away from that, but thank you. Um, thank you for the suggestions. You should see them pour in all the <laughs> how about El Elton sure. John in New York, you know, uh, and thank you guys. Um, El you know, one of them, I, I had someone say El Elton John once did a song about Philadelphia. Is there anything there? I said, that's one song. I don't know if I, you know, I don't think there's anything there. There's one song. Um, but, uh, the, what I want to look at next is, and, and kind of ties into the, the Stallone thing I was talking about, uh, story is, is the, is the legal aspect that comes to rock and roll, because really looking at, uh, Tom Petty with all he went through with his, with his legal battles with, you know, declaring bankruptcy and then fighting with the record label over the price of his next album, um, you begin to realize how much the law kind of plays into the entertainment business. Um, and just some wild stories, like this isn't the one I'd be focusing on in, in my proposal, but like how uh, John Fogarty once got sued for sounding too much like himself. Um, the famous <laughs> story behind that is, uh, you know, John Fogarty had this uh, amazing song for Credence, uh, the, the band that he was there, fronted called mm -hmm. Run Through the Jungle. And then years later in his solo career, he came out with a song called uh, The Old Man uh, Down the Road. Yes, that's right. His record label uh, at the time that or his record label that or the record label that owned the rights to the Credence music sued him and said, well, that's essentially the same song. You know, you're plagiarizing yourself. 
And, you know, it's just like a wild story where Fogarty was like, I'm the same guy. Of course, it sounds similar and had to come into court with his guitar and play both songs to show how they were different. Um, but it's just kind of it's it's kind of wild to see all that that uh, th- that kind of stuff and how that influences entertainment. So I'm, I'm looking at a couple of couple of those major stories to see how I could turn it into a, a book, because I feel there's a story there. Um, That's cool. You know, I love I've always been a fan of the stories of where either like what you're talking about, the legal wrangling or the, the, the way you have to be careful how contracts are worded and how agents want to word things for the, uh, you know, for the, the dot in the I's and crossing the T's. But I've also been a fan of when producers or other folks think that they have a better idea or they can't see the vision and they act, they act as the roadblock and then the band overcomes. I've always loved those stories as well. Yeah. I mean, like going back to what I was talking about, the Little White Lies uh, movie uh, article that I wrote. I mean, to me, I just find that it's wild that there's a movie featuring Sylvester Stallone, David Carradine, uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, Andrew Dice Clay was in it, uh, Burt Young from the Rocky movies. Um, Good grief. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, uh, boxing champ Vinnie Paz is in the movie, too. Um, all of these like major names, you know, or pretty big names. And, and Frank Stallone, of course are all in this movie and nobody has ever seen it because of legal issues. And, you know, that just seems like something that like, if, if, you know, Netflix or Hulu even had an idea it existed that, you know, just throw a couple thousand dollars at the problem and hope that it fixes it and then upload it and people would watch it because it's like this wild movie that, that was supposed to come out, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy to think that, that all that, you know, you, you create the art, but you know, how the legal aspect can really hold it back. Wow. I, I love being around creative people, uh, whatever their passion is. I mean, it's just, it's infectious. I'm sitting here thinking all the things I have yet to do that I'd like to. And one of them is write that great American book or, or whatever, and put enough thoughts that you can make it to the end. And, and I'm, I'm kind of feeling that inspiration again. So I'm, I'm so happy we brought you on. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I, you know, if I inspire anybody, that's, that's, that's good news because, and I hope they, they hope, I hope they go further than I ever did. Walt, you got anything else? Well, yeah, I could spend the whole rest of the night <laughs> <laughs> talking, but um, yeah, Christopher, I I really appreciate you coming on. It was great to meet you on on uh, Twitter like that and have this work out. We definitely are going to have to have you back as you uh, you know work on other projects and have other things to talk about with us. Yeah, I'd happy to happy to do it because uh, this, you know, it's always good to have a conversation with uh, people that are interested in what you do, and because it makes you feel like you're intelligent. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> well, we hopefully hit that bar pretty low for you. You should have been able to leap right on over it. Yeah, if you don't feel intelligent here, you're, you're not going to feel intelligent anywhere. <laughs> well, and Chris, before I we move on to the next segment, and you said you were going to hang out with us for a little bit, depending on how your uh, what I would still call a newborn at home. If, if he cooperates with you, is there anything more you wanted to let us know about the book or let the let the audience know about either where to find it, how to order it? Is it is it available through all the online sources like kind of give you a chance to pitch your material? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is titled Somewhere You Feel Free, Tom Petty and Los Angeles, and it could be found, you know, where you buy most things nowadays on Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble or any of the major retailers. However, considering everything that's going on in the world, uh, you know, I don't know when you're listening to this because it'll still apply. Um, I really would uh, recommend that you hunt out a local bookshop that, you know, I'm not going to say they're necessarily going to carry it, but they can order it for, for, for you and you can buy it through them. Uh, just because, you know, th- local businesses, small businesses, they're really hurting right now. So if you can get it from a local retailer, give it a shot uh, because I'm sure they would appreciate it. Um, uh, but if not, it's available on Amazon. So feel free to check it out there. Dude. I love that. You said that I had a chance to talk uh, on air in the Atlanta market on a uh, good on black Friday. And everybody kept talking about, well, this is the big day to shop. And I was like, you know, you can still shop at the small mom and pop store. And you know what? Maybe it cost a couple dollars more, but it probably saved you $20 in gas anyway drive stay local buy local and it keeps the money right in your own backyard yeah and you can actually go to one website it's called bookshop.org bookshop.org and if you search for a book it'll tell you where you could buy it locally or who you could contact 
at a at that at those bookstores, you know, which, which one you can contact that they'd be able to, you know, order it and then ship it to you or order it and have it for you to pick up. Um, but yeah, you know, I know Amazon makes it easy. You can't beat Prime delivery, you know. Uh, but uh, but if if you if you can if if you're willing to do it, I, I really encourage it. You know, my father owned a small business. Uh, and so I know how, how much they can, they can hurt at times like this. So, so please, if, if you have the opportunity, please do so. Well said, sir. I really appreciate that folks. You need to follow him on Twitter. You need to buy this book, the holidays, depending when you, if you're catching it now and it's dropping, but you know what, there's always a birthday or something coming up, get the book and, and give it to that person. Even if you, if, if they've never even heard of Tom Petty, it doesn't matter. Maybe they'll become a Tom Petty fan as a result. And then they'll buy a bunch of music as well. And actually, because I just looked it up, it's actually the book is actually cheaper on bookshop.org than it is on Amazon. So, hey, there you go. Wow. There you go. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, like I said, you you said you'll hang around as long as you can. If you have to duck out, you'll let us know because we're going to try to finish off a couple of our segments. And we always love having the guests, especially somebody who's got as many stories as you have. And as a obviously, you're a very good speaker as well. You're used to pitching your material and talking and good communicator. So feel free to jump in. We just riff on this. It's sort of like our version of MST3K where we just pick a couple of stories and I don't know what Walt's going to read. He doesn't know what I'm going to read. And so that means you don't know anything either, which is perfect. You, you, you fit in just fine with us for the rest of the show. So let's go to the next segment here, a segment we like to call bring out your date. Well, um, some good news, bad news. We have, um, we've lost Philip Dayton Thorpe. However, Philip has left us a a great self written obituary. Oh wow! Yeah. So this is not one where the family drafted. No, I think the family touched it up a little bit, and, <laughs> um, but he has written most of it, and he starts off with a with a great quote of his own. I told you this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Philip Dayton Thorpe, born in Salt Lake City on April first, nineteen thirty four, to Ward R. and Phyllis Dayton Thorpe and whose birth probably marked the beginning of April Fool's Day, died April 10th, 2018, from causes related to lifelong obesity and sleeping standing up. His grave marker will read, This corp is Phil Thorpe's. (laughs) It just gets worse, folks. Claude, C-L-O-D, as he was called even by those who knew his name, lived such a boring life that watching paint dry caused him to hyperventilate. His accomplishments will be published at a later date if they are ever discovered. (laughs) (laughs) He he served as an artillery officer in the U.S. Army. He served three missions for the LDS Church, but they stopped stopped sending him because he always came back. (laughs) He, He picked up three university degrees along the way, two of which he had to return. He was superseded in death by several billion people and is survived by his beloved wife of 55 years, Linda. She knew that that she had married way beneath herself as they honeymooned at the Salt Lake County landfill. She gave him six wonderful children at one time. Uh, I'm sorry, she gave him... Wow. <laughs> she she gave him six wonderful children one at a time. That would have been a that that's a been big a difference there, Walt. <laughs> crazier story. Sorry about that. They in turn provided him seven grandchildren and five step grandchildren. All have outlived him. In keeping with one of society's morbid mores, there will be a wee wake Sunday evening for 25 minutes and for six minutes before the funeral the following day. The price of admission for each of these events is one can of food for his wife to whom he left nearly nothing. (laughs) Burial will be in the backyard beside the dog his his wife would never let him have. Please don't send flowers. If you have a rush of generosity, then please just give to your favorite charity and tell them Phil sent you. Viewings will be held Sunday evening at the Holbrook Mortuary and at the SLC church on Monday, I guess it's one of the Mormon churches, from 9.30 to 10.30 prior to the service, and tournament will follow at the Holiday Memorial Cemetery. Guest books to post messages and tributes to the family available at the holebrookmortuary.com. Wow. Well, well, Phil, fair winds and following seas to wherever you go. Yeah, I just thought it was cool that he wrote his own uh, obituary. That... 
I guess makes things better on everybody. I, I love the line about all the accomplishments as soon as they discover whatever they may be. <laughs> yeah, I can somehow relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That an, another very good obit for the week. I have a right. question for that. Yeah. Um, it, it mentioned that he he will be buried in the backyard next to the dog he was never allowed to have. <laughs> I know. How, yeah. how did the dog get in the backyard buried then if they didn't have it? I couldn't figure that one out either. I I just kind of left that to Phil's uh, unique sense of humor. I had a feeling that was more or less a one last dig at his wife. No pun intended. I, I guess. I mean, that, that, I hope that's the explanation because otherwise uh, I'm I'm confused. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, and and I had to read that a couple times and try to figure out if it was just a a typo, but it fits with everything else that Phil Phil left us here. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. All right. Well, let's move to our weird news segment, a segment we like to call It's No Bullshit. Walt, you've got the first news story. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had a Halloween themed HOA story. And keeping with the holiday theme and the HOA story, we go to KFOR.com, Oklahoma's News 4, More Oklahoma. For one neighborhood and more, a homeowner's handmade holiday sign is causing quite the stir. Christmas is nothing more than a birthday celebration. If you don't want to go to someone's birthday party, don't go, said homeowner Doug Longway. That's what Longway has to say about a sign he made. It reads, You are now in Bedford Falls, a nod to the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. I wanted to do something different besides the typical Christmas lights, and I thought this would be a perfect sign to say Merry Christmas, and it's a callback to a great movie. It's a classic, Longway said. But just two days after he put the sign out near the entrance to his Moore neighborhood, Longway felt the opposite of holiday cheer. (laughs) Not from a homeowners association, no. Oh, no, certainly not. A woman I had never met before had posted a message on Facebook, on our neighborhood Facebook page, telling me to take it down or she will destroy it. Wow. Is her name Karen? Uh, I I would not be surprised. On Tuesday, the vice president of the HOA Association took to Facebook writing, if this is your sign, please remove it or it will be removed and destroyed by the end of the day. We contacted the HOA ourselves. The vice president initially declined to comment, but later called News 4 to say she wishes it hadn't come to this. (laughs) Not, I'm sorry, sorry I was a witch, but sorry it came to this. She also says the issue is not with the sign itself. It's about where it was initially posted at the front of the neighborhood. But Longway argues he had the right. The location where I posted originally is on my property. I know that based upon the plot map I was given (laughs) during escrow that clearly shows the wall behind me is on my property. So I felt there is no reason why I couldn't post a sign on that property, Longway said. On Friday, (laughs) Longway chose to move the sign back a few feet to his own driveway and chained it to his pickup truck. (laughs) And by the afternoon, he was back to finishing up the rest of his holiday decorating, hopefully to spread more cheer around the neighborhood. My hope is that people will put themselves in check and realize it's the wonderful time of year. Why would you go out of your way to spread hatred like this? I just don't understand that, Longway said. Longway tells us he has filed a police report. He says the HOA doesn't have the authority to destroy the sign. Since he has filed the report, the HOA says their lawyer has now gotten involved. Oh, dear Lord. Nobody in this can say, I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, they're just like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going one more step all in. Right, exactly. I'm one more step all in. (laughs) Well, another neighbor pointed out that that since the sign was initially changed to chained to a speed limit sign, it could be a code violation. Oh, dear God. We have contacted the city, and they are looking into it. So, KFOR on the job, (laughs) trying to sort out this homeowner bullshit issue. It's no bullshit. Do you realize in less than 25 days, it becomes a non-issue anyway? (laughs) Right. They'll probably do the same thing they did on that Halloween thing, where they give them 30 days to take it down. You have 30 days to take this down. Great. It's two weeks before Halloween. No problem. (laughs) (laughs) Great. The, uh, 
the 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 plot twist i think the plot twist here is that this daughter is the descendant of old man potter and uh <laughs> she's just he's just furious that it's not a potterville sign and that's why he's you know causing so many she's causing so many issues oh that my may god be the that's only awesome. logical explanation yeah uh, the only that i mean i just can't imagine i mean wh- how would she react if he actually put one that said like north pole up would it be a worse reaction or would it be a would it be just as just as bad <laughs> you're, you're now bringing santa into the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> well and i love the fact that he 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 moves the sign but he feels like he has to chain it to his truck to keep anybody from stealing it. Well, it's been threatened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess in more Oklahoma, there's just not much to do. <laughs> well, I've, I've always, I get why you have HOAs. I appreciate them. But at the same time, they feel like it's their own little fiefdom and they can rule like it's like their own little like lords of the land. And I'm just like, oh, stop it. So... <laughs> Uh, this is an example, I think, of where it was probably just one. You know, it's just the one. Everybody else is like, oh, dear Lord, Karen's at it again. Yep. You know? Yep. So. Okay. Well, I've got one. You know, people pick kind of funny names sometimes for their kids. They think they're being clever. Well, sometimes you should probably research the name before you name it. When it comes to picking up a baby name, is this uh, there's a story, actually, of a sister-in-law who refuses to use her niece's new full name, saying, quote, My brother and his girlfriend had a baby two months ago. I didn't visit her in the hospital due to the restrictions, but I quickly found out what they named her. They called her Selexa. Now, if you don't know that name, just simply do a Google search and you'll find out it is a drug brand for a major antidepressant. (laughs) Selexa is a prescription medicine used to treat symptoms of depression. (laughs) <laughs> Selexa may be used alone or with other medications, and Selexa belongs in a class of drugs called antidepressants. Even Googling the name Selexa as a baby name yields results of medications. A close second is Alexa, but imagine that name today with everybody that's had the speaker from Amazon saying, quote, I don't understand the thought process behind choosing that name, but I really can't stand it. And I laugh every time someone in the family refers to her. She said she has decided to nickname her niece Lexa, which is a name she can actually stomach. She goes, nicknames are fun. And since Selexa is really just, you know, Lexa short for it, the mom didn't seem to notice. But uh, the fact is she can't use the real name. She says, when my brother's girlfriend asked me why I never actually just call her Selexa, I told her, you know, it's the name of medication, right? So (laughs) now apparently I've got her upset. Because she's worried that people are going to bully her daughter, saying, nobody in my family seems to be on my side. So now I'm wondering, was it a mistake to even point it out? According to Reddit, the sister-in-law was the one in the wrong, uh, saying, YTA, not for answering her question, but you're, you're the, I guess you're the ass. You're the ass, not for answering her question, but for unilaterally deciding your niece's name sucks, then laughing at it, and then <laughs> refusing to call her by it. <laughs> Someone else wrote, I doubt little kids are going to know what the brand of some kind of antidepressant is called. And by the time they're old enough, it'll probably be called something else. Then another said, yeah, you're you are the ass. I mean, basically, you're the first bully in this kid's life. So congrats (laughs) on that. People sometimes have unusual names and being so immature and petty that you refuse to refer to a human being by their name is stupid and mean to grow up. Yeah. Wow. Finally, someone said escalated fast. (laughs) Yes. Finally, someone said, you've done a good job of proving your point. You're the first to pick on the kid for her name. Congratulations. It's no bullshit. I guess in this case, the sister-in-law who laughed at her uh, her brother's girlfriend, who not didn't know where they got the name or why Selexa may not be a great name, but ended up getting in trouble for it by posting it on social media. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I you know, do wonder, though, where where the name came from in the first place, because, you know, is it were they aware that it was a drug or or maybe they're fans of a drug? Because in that case, like, <laughs> are, are you, are, you know, are you naming your kid after things that you really like? Like, I, mean, I didn't I didn't name my son baseball or, you know, scotch. Um, scotch. I, I, there you go. I gave him a real I gave him a real name. But, hey, you know, I, if that's if that's the, the, the way you're going, I guess I guess it works. Well, my brother, Penison. Dylan gave his kids some weird names. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> hey, hey, Matt, 
Methamphetamine, get over here. <laughs> You're always getting into trouble. <laughs> yeah, my sister Weed is uh, going to weigh in on this one. Well, and this kind of goes back to why can't people just leave people alone? Yeah, that's the other thing. You know, if you want to call your, well, I get it sometimes. I, I'll tell you, as a parent, we went through that with our girls. We, every single one, we thought, okay, does it rhyme with anything that can be used to go after them? Does do the initials, if somebody finds out their middle name, does that spell <clears> something <throat> funny or is that going to get them in trouble? We literally, as parents, thought about making sure whatever we named our child didn't have some kind of hidden connotation that would come back and haunt them in their early years of school. Yeah, we did the same thing. Well, that and also, you know, keeping in mind, like even stuff that you may not ne- immediately think of, like initials, like do your initials spell something weird right. um, or uh. something offensive or, or you just got to make sure because there's there's a lot of three letter words and acronyms that, that could get you in trouble. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, one of the ones we had 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 we not paid attention, her initials would have been ASS and like, oh, we can't have our initials be ass. <laughs> no, not at all. That doesn't work so well. Or, you know, you've got the family member that goes. You know, we haven't had a Gertrude in a while. I'm like, there's a reason we haven't had a Gertrude oh in a while. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not doing that to the Why child. Why is it our number that came up that has to have the Gertrude, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then you put that on someone else, maybe when the name actually comes back in style, like, you know, four generations from now. Well, and you don't want the child, like, growing up to with some hippie name and then them become, like, some raving conservative or, you know, you name them Reagan and then they end up being some hippie. You know, th- there's there's a lot that goes into this stuff. Yeah, it, 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 there's, like, the formula for it. You just can't just come up with anything. So, all right. Well, that's what I have for story number one. Walt, what about you? Story two. Okay, this one comes from oddityCentral.com, and I did have to go to another source just to make sure that this wasn't some nonsense thing, (laughs) but apparently this is true. Kid shoves metal coin in his nose, forgets about it for 53 years. What? A 59-year-old in Russia lived with a serious nose-breathing difficulties for over half a century because of a (laughs) coin he had shoved up his nose as a child and forgot about over the years. Doctors at the hospital, whose name I will never be able to pronounce, (laughs) in Zolinograd recently reported the strange case of a patient who said he had been completely unable to breathe through his right nostril for several months. A CT scan showed that the right nasal passage was completely blocked by a foreign (laughs) body of stony density stuck in the posterior close to the nasopharynx, hopefully I got that right, a more common uh, curvature of the septum was also observed, or a, a uh, anyway, he had a bad curve in his, <laughs> in his sinuses, but it would not have obstructed the navel, nasal passage completely all by itself. The foreign object was the problem, but the deviated septum had emphasized the breathing difficulties to the point where the patient had no choice but to seek help. The 59-year-old patient had never told the doctors that a foreign object might be the cause of this breathing of the breathing problems, but that's only because he had no idea himself. It was only after seeing the CT scan and the mysterious round object that the unnamed man recalled playing with a small one kopeck coin and shoving it into <laughs> his nose when he was about six years old. All right, parenting tip for our younger member of our group here on the in the call. Watch where you have the pennies. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Because his mother was very strict, he was too afraid to tell her that the coin had gotten stuck in his right nostril, so he just left it there. And as time went on, he forgot all about it. Doctors were skeptical about the story at first, but after removing the coin during an endoscopic operation which lasted an hour and a half, and examining it, they started to believe him. The rhinolith, nasal stone that usually forms around a foreign object, on the metal coin indicated that the object had been in the man's nose for quite some time, (laughs) and half a century didn't seem that unlikely anymore. During the procedure to remove the coin, doctors also fixed his deviated septum, which improved his nasal breathing even more. However, ENT specialist uh, Dr. Elena something or other told the Moscow press agency that the man was so sick of having his nose blocked that he yanked out the bandage soon after waking up from anesthesia. 
Doctors said that the man was lucky to regain full nasal breathing capacity and avoid serious complications caused by the foreign object in his sinuses for that long. In such cases, various intracranial and septic complications may occur, but the 59-year-old didn't experience anything but breathing difficulties. It's no bullshit! So there's a lot to learn from that. Number one, don't shove stuff up your nose. <laughs> And and kids love to do that. It's like, hey, it's an opening. Put something in it. Yes. Uh, in fact, my youngest managed to shove a bead up her nose, and we had to go to the ER. She almost had to have surgery for it. So definitely a lesson to learn. Kids do some strange things. Yes, they do. My my first thought on that was, and I don't think it was addressed in the article, I guess the guy has never taken a plane flight or had to go through a metal detector <laughs> anywhere because... <laughs> I mean, that would, I would assume it would, it would, it would go off, you know, and they say, excuse, excuse me, sir, you have an, un, 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 you know, you have unidentified metal object in your head. Your, your head is setting off our alarm. <laughs> yeah. We, we need you to, we need you to step aside and search you. But so I, I guess, you know, he's never had, never been on a flight or anything, but wow. that, that's my only guess. I just love how there's this, enough crust that's grown up around it. It's like, well, it's gotta been in there for about 50 years. Yeah. That's just amazing. Oh, ugh. How do you forget that, though? Well, there are actually pictures on the website showing them, like, chiseling off all the stuff, and there's the coin. But, I mean, how do you honestly forget that? I mean, he was freaked out enough to go, my mom was really strict, and I didn't want to upset her. So how does that not form a memory that goes, yeah, I just decided to ignore it? And, like, how how do you forget something like that? Uh, You would think that he would say, hey, Doc, probably the reason I'm suffocating is I shoved some currency up my nose. Did he think it would just dissolve over time? Well, he is shoving stuff up, you know, coins up his nose. He's probably not the <laughs> brightest guy. <laughs> Maybe. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, let's uh, let's circle around to our last news story. And Walt, this is going to make me feel pretty good because I'm kind of already borderline there anyway with my hair. And I know you used to love it, and maybe you can bring it back. But did you know having a mullet may, in fact, be coming back in style? Awesome. According to this story, and it's starting with kids, by the way, another kid's story, mullets have been, of course, a hairdo over time, then often loved and then often hated. But this Texas boy was praised for his good looks and took three top prizes in the Mullet Champ USA 2020 Kids Mullet Championship. Wow. Second, did you know that there was a mullet championship (laughs) for kids? I, I was not aware of that. Yes, and apparently this is the 2020 championship. At eight years old, Jax, J-A-X, received over 20,000 votes and over 50,000 social media reactions, winning first place for his curly mullet. According to the contest officials, he also won a $500 cash prize and a gift card to the Bridge Street Exchange in Fenton. Now, Noah from Illinois was just 12 when he won second place along with a $200 cash prize. He was also awarded Neff Shades and a gift card package. And then Jude, age seven from Colorado, took third winning a cash prize, some shades, and another gift card. Now, the contest was popular and in turn gained a lot of traffic on Facebook. The winners were determined back in the late October time frame, around the 27th. Now, the contest has blown up with over 20,000 votes from all over the country. It has been truly amazing to see these kids get all the spotlight and have this contest get picked up by the local news, radio stations, and even national outlets like Bro Bible and Yahoo. During these tough times, it's important to have fun. That's exactly what 2020 needed, said contest officials in a statement. It really is true. This has been a rough year for legit, uh, for legit, for the whole world. So the more fun things to happen, the better. Also, mullets are coming back. So watch out for the style or maybe have your kid grow one out and maybe they'll win you a couple of hundred bucks that you can take and go get some gift cards and do some things with. After all, it's the year of quarantine cuts, making it totally acceptable to have all kinds of haircuts or not having a haircut in some cases. And now that winter is coming, and on top of that, we're supposed to be staying home, it's the perfect time to do whatever you want with your hair. It's amazing. It's astounding. But it's no bullshit. So, Walt, I'm bringing it back. I'm going I'm to get the mullet back. Why not? I was a child of the 80s. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and it's party in the what? What is it? A uh, business, business in the front, in the party front, in the party back, in the, ra- in the back. <laughs> I mean, that may help us get through the rest of twenty twenty. 
<laughs> Chris, I've got another subject for your book, The History of the Mullet. You know, uh, th- certainly that would be a good gag gift for people to buy at, at the very least. So I'm sure they would move some copies. <laughs> you know, though, I have heard, though, you know, I've seen some things that remind me of like 80s looking clothes and some things on kids today. I was like, oh, dear Lord, are we going to really go back and do all this? Are we going to have the 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 hair stick out with, you know, uh, you know, entire can of hairspray? Are we going to have like the big shoulder pads? I, I, I've I've always heard that things come around, but do we really want all of the '80s coming back? Well, the hairspray worries me because we just started getting good about the environment and the ozone layer, and now, <laughs> well, why and now we're, yeah, it's all Aquanet, fixed now. <laughs> Aquanet is just going to drive us right back into, into a disaster. Well, that'll be the one thing that's different. We'll have some kind of like uh, gelatinous goo instead. So, to, you know, so we're not doing aerosol, but you still have to hold the brush out of your hair and, and hair dry it, you know, for like five minutes till it crusts up. <laughs> yeah, my wife, I mean, I, I, I think you're a little bit younger than us, but I mean, we were teenagers for me. My wife was a teenager in the 80s. I graduated in 88 uh, from high school. And, you know, like the 80s, the music will always be part of me. I love the 80s movies. But you look back at like your pictures and I said, like, did we really think that was cool? Yeah, that's why you did it. Yeah, right. At the time it was. But I'm, I, you know, I just hope they don't bring the Miami Vice thing back. I don't, I don't need to see the pastel T-shirts and the rolled up, uh, you know, buttonless suit coats and and sock, you know, going without socks and shoes. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing that is good about that article is you pointed me to something called the Bro Bible, <laughs> <laughs> BroBible dot dot com. I've never heard of that before, but now now I'm. <laughs> Now well, there's two fan. things, the Bro Bible and the Mullet Champ USA Mullet Championship for kids. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to learn there. Well, one of the headlines on, on Bro Bible is LSU's top wide receiver, Terrence Marshall, opts out of season after giving passionate speech about not giving up. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> so Fantastic. I'll be spending some time on there this week. <laughs> All right, well, let's move into our final segment as we begin to wrap up the show. This is a chance for us to let everybody know what we're watching, what we're reading, and what we're listening to. It's a bit of entertainment. So, Walt, we'll start off with you, and then we'll go to Chris, and then to me, and we'll go around. We'll do what you're watching or streaming first, so that's the first category. Walt, anything you want to recommend to what you're watching, what you're streaming? Yeah, well, I have to um, I have to say I have to eat some crow right off the bat because you've been talking about a show and you were like, if you watch the first five minutes, you're going to be hooked. And I was like, okay, I'm going to watch the first five minutes and not be hooked. But I watched the first five minutes of The Boys on Amazon Prime <laughs> and I'm hooked. So thank you, Alan. <laughs> And, and thank you, my arrogance and pride for <laughs> tr- trying to prove that I could not be hooked. But this is a great show. I'm about three episodes in and I love it. So now, do you remember what I told you that there's going to be a moment where you're just going to be like your brain can't necessarily process what what you just watched? I, I had to go back and watch it twice more. I was like. And it's both shocking and horrifying and then like amazing at the same time. Like, oh, 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 oh my God. <laughs> and you're like, how has this never happened before? How has this never been on a show? But it is awesome. And then it's also got a very, it, it's like the darkest humor of anything you'll ever see. But it sets the course for this show. It is fantastic. Wait till you get to season two. So I I love the boys. That is a as an Amazon uh, Prime special. They, they spend a lot on the production value, and I think uh, it's such a cool take on the comic book kind of world we live in, with all the movies being related to powers or superpowers or comic book superheroes. To to get more of a real world view of just kind of a, what kind of a kind of a dirt bag would you really be if you could like beat up everybody in the room? Right, and and I think it's interesting their take on it that it basically took superheroes and commercialized them. Oh yeah. That and too. So it's like, what would that world be like? And it's really funny and entertaining and dark and, uh, kind of right up my alley. So thanks for challenging me to watch that. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> so then I also watched the world is not enough. I will still hold to my opinion on who the worst bond is after watching that. What, and- what compelled you to watch that? <laughs> Uh, it popped up on my um, on my Netflix as a suggestion, 
And I was like, surely this is not as bad as I remember it being. And it's there's only one good. good Pierce Brosnan Bond, and that was the first one. After that, they all go down. Here. Yeah, they do. They do. And it's it's sad because I love Bond. But and then I'm just about done with Enterprise. So I'm going to finish Enterprise here in the next day or two. And then I'll jump back over and watch the boys. Oh, excellent. Excellent. All right, let's go over to Christopher. You didn't you didn't weigh in on uh, the boys. Have you seen that at all on Netflix on uh, Amazon Prime? You know, I actually read a first uh, the first couple issues of the comic when it came out years ago, um, and uh, you know, it was definitely funny and had a lot of its moments. But I, I just kind of fell out of it. I can't remember what I was doing at the time. Um, but I just, I, you know, kind of fell out of it and I've been meaning to catch up with the comic before I watch the show. Cause I hear people just rave about it just like this. Um, but, uh, maybe I should just jump in the show and forget about reading. I don't know. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's so well-written. It is definitely adult. You don't want to have the kids anywhere in earshot because nope. the main character's favorite word, uh, is, is the C word. And it's just, it's, it, it's fantastic, but it's gory, but it's almost so over the top. It's not. It's not like Walking Dead gore. It's almost like, whoa. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, now in terms of uh, what, what I've been streaming and listening to, well, first of all, we just passed the Thanksgiving holiday. So I have to give uh, my annual tradition of watching Planes, Trains, and Automobiles every oh, year. Oh, awesome. Great movie. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, was, it was my grandfather's favorite movie. And uh, just absolutely, uh, you know, just and not that it's even that that old of a movie. Like it, it's not like it's a it's, it's not like Bedford Falls. It's a wonderful life here, where we're talking about a movie that has uh, got got some uh, got some miles under the hood. Uh, Plane, trains, and automobiles, just such a fantastic Thanksgiving celebration. Still makes me crack up every time I see it. Uh, always always get sad at the end thinking about how many great movies John Candy probably still had in him. No oh, kidding. Yeah, you know he really was just so good in everything he did. So uh, so that I got to give a shout out to um and steve martin being the being the straight man in the movie is is hilarious because you know up until then he was in like the jerk and things like that where he was the comedian and in this movie he kind of recasts himself as being the straight man which he later did in other movies like father the bride and stuff where he could be like funny but still sort of a leading man sort of thing so this was big in his career but i've always been a john hughes fan and always liked his his take on on comedy uh so so that was you know, that's what i'm streaming I was going to say the exact same thing. Having been growing up in the 80s, I mean, I, I think there's not a John Hughes movie that I don't like. And he sort of was the voice of so many things that were uh, of the time. And, uh, and it's just such a great movie to watch Steve Martin and John Candy interact with one another. And you're right. It is a classic. Yeah. And, and when it comes to John Hughes, I think there's, there's a lot of... A, a lot of people that have tried to recapture that in their movies, you, you often hear a movie is, is is like a John Hughes movie, and it's never quite the same. He just had a very unique voice in the way he wrote his characters and presented uh, his empathy for his characters that I, has never really been duplicated um, by by anyone who's, who's... You know, the closest might be, and you, since you're an entertainment guy, might be Cameron Crowe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Cameron Crowe, uh, especially movies like, um, y you know, Jerry Maguire and um, one of almost my favorites, famous. Almost Famous, yeah, is really probably my favorite thing that he did. Um, but I don't think he has the, uh, he doesn't have the batting average that John Hughes had. I mean, John True. Hughes was, almost every movie was was uh, was out of the park. Or not nearly as prolific. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, but yeah, no, that's another good, I mean, you, you fast times at Ridgemont high, you know, which all, all of this good stuff. Well, anything else that you're streaming? Cause you watch the movie. Are you, are you hooked in any shows right now? You know, the Queen's no, Gambit's you know like what? really, I'm really right not I'm like every other person who watches the Mandalorian and, and that's pretty oh, much yeah. what I go to, um, you know, that I know that probably makes me kind of boring, but, uh, but it's a great show. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up a star Wars fan and have pretty much been disappointed by the last 20 years of everything <laughs> you fit right in here yeah so to see something that that kind of makes me say okay star wars is cool again it's kind of interesting um I, i'm liking it so i'm happy that i'm happy to catch up with that every week um but uh yeah other than that uh, that's pretty much my mainstream that right now well, and every, every time The Mandalorian comes up, I say the same thing, and that is that the team doing The Mandalorian should be in charge of the Star Wars universe right now. Yeah, well, John Favreau, who's uh, one of the, the main guys behind the show, he's another guy who's just uh, almost everything he's done I loved. 
Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, even uh, speaking of which uh, it's the holiday season, I mean, he, he made, he made elf, he was the director of elf and think of like what the big gap between elf and the Mandalorian. I mean, that shows, uh, you know, versatility. If you can do the, Ma- create the Mandalorian, co-create that show and also make one of Will Ferrell's funniest comedies. Can't disagree. I'll, Crazy. I know we're going to, we're pressed for time. I will jump on the Mandalorian bandwagon. I don't get some of the fanboys in the last three or four days upset about, quote, seeing now that we've got Ashoka thrown in there and we're going to have white lightsabers and then we throw in Grand Admiral Thrawn as if somehow this is a bad thing. I think there is just a subset of fanboys that just are not going to be happy no matter what. I've been thrilled, and I think this was one of the most cinematically interesting and artistic episodes of them all so far. The combination of having an old-fashioned Western duel happening outside the city while you have an old-fashioned Eastern-style duel happening inside the city simultaneously, brilliant. And having Michael Bean as a as a cameo, uh, loved it this past week. So for me, it's been The Mandalorian, and I'm nearly done Star Trek Next Generation. Uh, season 7 is midway through. So let's go around quickly to what are you reading, if anything? Walt, I think we know one of the books you're reading. I was going to say, the only thing I wrote down was uh, somewhere you feel free, Tom Petty in Los Angeles. I'm loving it, and I, I highly, highly, highly recommend everybody pick that up. Yeah, it's definitely going to be in my. Actually, I'm I'm going to be talking to Christopher online at some point because I know we won't have time tonight. I'm going to see what I can do to maybe get a, 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 a an autograph copy for the wife for the holidays if that's possible. Oh, absolutely. Well, hopefully she's not going to be listening to this. She doesn't listen to me. She unless won't. I'm about to say yeah. something bad about her. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. If anyone is looking for an autographed copy, I should have them ready to go in the beginning of December, um, which probably be after this. Yeah. So certainly just go to yeah. my website, chrismckit.com and um, C-H-R-I-S-M-C-K-I-T.com and hit the contact button and just write me an email. Awesome. I will definitely do that because my wife was an even bigger Tom Petty fan than me. So I figured this would be a cool gift for her. Oh, happy to do so. All right. So what are you reading, if anything, Chris? Uh, you know what? I got to I got to take a pass on this one. I'm really okay. not in into any any books right now because I am so busy trying to promote this one that I gotcha and, and write my next one that I have, have no time to read. But I'm looking to get back into that as soon as the holidays are over. I totally, totally understand that my new my one of my jobs is in in uh, talk radio and I feel like I read so much news. The last thing I want to do is read anymore. I just want to come home for a drink, a good stiff one and start, you know, getting involved in an online game or play something virtually where it has nothing to do with news, current events, anything. I could just go, you know, live in a fantasy world for a few hours. So I totally dig it. All right, then let's go to the top and the last category, Walt, what are you listening to? Well, I'm going to throw out Three things real quick. Uh, first, I was just a guest. Uh, we just recorded over the weekend on the Dirty Harry Minute, and we are looking at a uh, uh, one of the great uh, Dirty Harry movies. Um, well, I, I will say it's great. It's probably number three on my list. But if you uh, if you get a chance to listen to Dirty Harry Minute, they're going through all of uh, the Dirty Harry movies minute by minute. And those guys are great. They're, it's an Australian team, and uh, they're really fantastic, just great folks. And one of them just had twins. So uh, if for nothing else, out of mercy and pity, please go <laughs> check out the Dirty Harry Minute. Um, also, Super Ego, which is one that I'll hit on every once in a while, uh, they have a forgotten classic that they just re-released. They, <laughs> what they do is they go through on these forgotten classics, and they don't read the book. They just read the character list and an explanation of the characters, and then they just assume what the book is, and each one of them (laughs) takes one of the characters, and they go through and basically rewrite Withering Heights, in this case. Uh, That's on uh, Super Ego on any podcatcher. And then uh, somebody turned me on to the Dennis Miller option. Um, Dennis Miller, this week, you probably, even if you don't check out the rest of his stuff, he interviews a guy named Tom Dreesen who is a lifelong comedian, and he has worked with some of the great comics. I think he said that he was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson 14 times or something like that. So he has some great stories about the old days of stand-up comedy, and um, he was... Remember the guy who played Venus Flytrap um, on WKRP? The two of them had a, a... 
pairing a comedy show that played all over the country. And he talks a little bit about what it was like as a white guy and a black guy to go into these white and black bars and just the, how they were able to turn these crowds from basically yelling all kinds of horrible racist stuff to being fans. And uh, so it's a real interesting show. So Dennis Miller option, Tom Dreesen is the guy that he's interviewing uh, this week and uh, definitely worth taking your time to check that out. Christopher, what about you? Are you, uh, are you listening to any albums new or anything podcast listening wise? What could you recommend to the audience? I, I'm going to go with albums on this one uh, because it's so nice to see stuff like stuff come out that that re- that really get into. And I got to say, the new ACDC album that just came out, it's called Power Up, is is fantastic, and it's so great to hear these guys together again. Because if you're if if you're like me and you're a huge ACDC fan, you know the story. But on their last tour, the band pretty much completely fell apart. Um, obviously, Malcolm Young, who's really the the the, the the brains behind the band um, had to retire uh, and has unfortunately passed away because of dementia. Um, his, his nephew, Stevie Young j- has stepped in and, and, and carried his, his carried the band on uh, along with his, his uncle, his uncle Angus, who we all know in the schoolboy costume. Mm-hmm. But uh, during the last tour, um, Brian Johnson, the voice of the band had to leave because he was suffering from hearing loss where his doctors told him, if you do not stop performing in stadiums, and arenas you're going to lose your hearing completely Mm -hmm. um he's gotten some kind of experimental treatment that has restored his hearing that he signed a non-disclosure agreement about which is why he can't really talk about it but it to me that's incredible hopefully that can go on and help a lot of people who are in the similar boat um and uh the drummer phil rudd had to leave the band because he was arrested for threatening to kill somebody um (laughs) which is yeah you gotta be careful Yeah, got to be careful with that one. Uh, those charges seem to have been cleared up. Um, and uh, a- after that, the bassist Cliff Williams was like, "This, you know, this isn't the same band because Axl Rose stepped in to sing for ACDC for the last couple dates on the tour." Um, and Cliff Williams said, "Hey, I- I'm going to retire from this. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not the same band anymore." Um, so, as a huge ACDC fan, I was really kind of sad, hoping that we weren't going to see like one of these examples, like with Foreigner, where you got one guy who's part of them lineup and then a bunch of other guys thrown into the band and and you know because it's just not the same band to me um and uh i'm i know there's some people that don't care but i care you know uh Mm -hmm. so it's cool that they were able to kind of get the core of the band back together and put out what i think is 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 a killer album and uh really made uh put a smile on my face in in this in in this year you know i've heard nothing but good things about that album and that the single that's out right now uh it's awesome i I heard a clip of it as a sort of a facebook kind of an ad and i was like holy crap these guys are killing it they they sound just as good as they did when they put out thunderstruck yes i mean it's 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 pretty incredible you know that a band that keeps doing the same thing over and over again uh just manage to kill it every time because they know what they're doing i put them in the same category as motorhead you know these are just bands (laughs) that that actually just were amazing at what they did and they just kept doing it Awesome. I'm going to get, I mean, I was going to get it anyway, but to have such an endorsement from me, from you, I'm already going to, I'm going to running. Well, actually, I probably at this time of year, I'm supposed to put it on my list of things to get me for Christmas. So hopefully maybe someone will get it for me. Uh, what else? Anything else you want to, you want to pitch or throw out that you're listening to? No, I mean, I've obviously a lot of Tom Petty to celebrate my book. Uh, you know, he's got the new Wildflowers expanded edition that came out, yeah, um, which got a lot album, of cool gems album. on it. Um, and, uh, you know, his channel on Sirius XM is always a fun listen to because you hear the old show. He, he used to host his own show on there and they keep replaying them. And he had a fun sense of humor. So that's always fun to listen to. Excellent. Yeah, I can't I can't disagree. Those I love the the Tom Petty channel. It's one of the ones marked on my uh, on my on my radio in the car. Um I will jump very quickly into something that they did on one of the Sirius XM channels over the Thanksgiving holiday and I thought it was the coolest thing they had asked asked their listeners on the classic rewind station which is the, the their their throwback is this is the cassette era which of course I grew up listening to cassette tapes in the car and at home before CDs came out and they did the top 500 of their uh, of all the songs that they have in their in their library and they just kept repeating the entire Thanksgiving holiday. I had Sirius XM streaming either at home, in my car, or on my phone for basically four and a half straight days, catching up on music that was just 
fantastic. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the podcast alone this week. We'll give shout outs next week in in deference to our guest on the time that he's got left with us, and just say if you haven't checked out Classic Rewind, if you like kind of like the the Gen Xer crowd, like we all are, sort of the 80s and the 90s, and you remember some of the 70s as well. Uh, the Classic Rewind Station is a great one to listen to on Sirius XM. Well, I, I would agree with you. I, I listened to it way too much over the weekend, too, and it is my number three go-to on XM. It's Grateful Dead channel, Tom Petty channel, and then then that channel. So Yeah, I, Classic I would, Rewind. I agree with you. And, and it's always fun to hear the VJs talk about the same yeah. stories over and over again. Yes. Uh, it, it, they seem to be, they still seem to be entertaining when you hear, it's, it's, it's still entertaining when you hear Mark Goodman say, well, you know, uh, there was a time that I met Rick Springfield at a bar after he played. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's the same story you told last week, but and it's a good one. You know, I do love that they've gotten all of those MTV VJs to, to host things like the 80s channel or the, the, the classic rewind. Um, I, I, I dig the XM. I love, I, I don't like having to pay for it necessarily sometimes when the bill comes up annually, but then I get so much enjoyment out of listening to it now that they've opened it up to be able to stream it or like we've got an Alexa at home. So we, I downloaded the skill set and, and linked the two together. So I can, I can come inside and say, Alexa, play the Sirius XM station and it just plays and it's awesome. So, well, you know, they, they've started a podcast among that, those M- MTV, um, VJs, uh-huh. it is worth every dime you're paying for XM to hear Alan Hunter try to explain what a podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that's going to do it, Chris. Thank you for hanging out with us to the end. We really appreciate it, man. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Really appreciate you joining us. And uh, again, enjoying your books. Uh, really appreciate all your hard work there. Walt, if you can, very quickly, the Reader's Digest version, how do people learn a little bit more about The Wilder Ride? I'm just going to give you one place. Go to facebook.com slash the wilder ride. Follow us there and then join our listeners group. It's great. It's all entertainment. It's no politics, no nothing else, just us and entertainment. And uh, so that's where you find us. And it's the wilder ride everywhere else, social media, the website. We own the name. It's the brand. It's us. So check it out. Don't forget to rate, review and share. That always is, makes it better for us. We get uh, it's free advertising, but at the same time, it doesn't cost you anything either. And come on back next week. We've got just a few more episodes left in the 2020 year. We'll be closing up for the holidays, taking a few weeks off. So come on back. You have no idea who's coming up next week, probably because we don't know either. But come on back next week and you'll find out who the guest is on the next edition of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. Chris, I'm glad we were able to get you to hang to the end. I know you, you you probably had to go, but thanks so much. Oh, no problem. No, no. I, the kid started wailing. He's still kind of wailing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll go get him. I will, I will hit you up on your website and or social media. But yeah, as soon as uh, I, I want to try to get one for the wife, I think she would love having a, uh, an autograph. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. When you hit the dance floor, you got to be jumping, Jack. Jump on. Jumping. When you hit the dance floor, you gotta be jumping, Jack.